I wonder if you've had an experience in your life that marks the before and after of your life story. That experience that breaks open how you know yourself and the world forevermore. That life-changing divide came for our family on a Sunday afternoon in April of 2015. My husband Steve and I were in the middle of busy careers and community life and mostly in love with our 13-year-old daughter, Hannah Rose, and our nine-year-old wild child, Ben. Life was full of piano lessons and early ice time, Lego creations, and general mayhem. On that particular Sunday, Ben was in the middle of a youth hockey tournament. We were home that morning awaiting the championship game in the afternoon, and Ben was talking smack about how his teammates were going to dominate the other team and celebrate afterwards with endless Cheetos and Gatorade. It was an incredible, ordinary Sunday. But suddenly, Ben started to gasp for air. He held his throat and fell down. And to be honest, at first I thought he was teasing me. He was such a prankster and jokester. But I started to realize that he couldn't breathe. And within minutes, the before of our life came to an abrupt end. We later found out that Ben had an asymptomatic, undiagnosed infection in his trachea that at that moment had begun to swell and close his airways. Ben was airlifted to Children's Hospital in Minneapolis, but despite the best efforts of the emergency and medical teams, he was not able to be revived. Ben died on April 13th, 2015, and I've been navigating the life after ever since. Scientists tell us that most of the cells in our body regenerate every seven years. It's been seven years since we lost Ben, and in many ways, I do feel transformed. Our daughter is thriving as an adult. My husband and I have rebuilt and deepened our marriage, and I'm more courageous and compassionate in the work that I do in the world. Still, when I think back to those early days of acute grief, I am leveled with even the memory of how intense the pain was that we experienced. Neurologists that study the grieving brain show that MRIs of the newly heartbroken resemble that of someone experiencing a physical burn or an electrical shock. As discouraging as the statistics are on marriages surviving the death of a child, the health outcomes are actually much worse. Stress hormones flood our body, dysregulating sleep and digestion. Our immune systems are compromised, and even cognitive processing is altered. It's estimated that in the U.S. alone, economic impact of grief is $75 billion due to lost productivity, absenteeism, health care claims, and disability. And just this past year, prolonged grief disorder has been classified as a diagnosis for mental health insurance claims. Even so, grieving isn't a pathology. Grieving is the most natural, inevitable process of adaptation for dealing with the realities of life and death. It's actually the common denominator in the human experience. So what makes the difference in the natural cycle of learning and healing from loss, no matter how excruciating, and that debilitating chronic sorrow that is the burden of so many? For our family after Ben died, 
we were surrounded by multiple communities that gave hands-on loving care to help us through those days and months. I can honestly say that I don't think we'd be standing without the intimate, sustained care that they provided. But I've thought about during the pandemic, how do families make it when this social and cultural scaffolding that is supposed to hold us up in the most difficult times has collapsed? What happens when you can't physically gather to be with one another during morning rituals, to wipe each other's tears, to look at scrapbooks, to laugh about the stories of your beloved? I decided to become a grief educator during COVID to support families that were going through what we had but several years earlier. And in that process, I learned how deeply hardwired we are from the perspective of evolutionary biology to truly respond to each other in our greatest times of need. Not just our survival, but our ability to thrive after loss is dependent on our ability to come together, to meet each other not just in pain, but in the after of reconstructing a world after what we have lost. For example, when I cry tears of sorrow, they are chemically different than the tears that would spring forth to wipe away an irritant from my eye. It is an emotional SOS that I am sending out that I can't be alone. We know that isolation is the greatest threat to survival. We see this in the primate world. When an infant chimpanzee dies and its mother holds that lifeless infant for days or even weeks until she is ready to lay the infant to rest. During that time, the troop surrounds her, grooming her and feeding her, ensuring her survival during this wildly disorienting liminal time between the before and the after. I experienced that. I had two nights in Children's Hospital to hold Ben while we were awaiting the preparations for organ donation. The day I finally left the hospital, I looked around and suddenly saw people walking on the street, talking and laughing and cars going through traffic, and I collapsed. I could not conceive a world that was continuing while mine inexplicably stopped. I needed my troop to surround me, to hold me, to ensure my survival over that bridge. There was a group of women that were ready for that intimate care. They called themselves with women in the house. When Steve went back to work and Hannah back to school, one of these ladies in waiting would just be present with me. They didn't counsel or try to cheer me up. They knew better than to say everything happens for a reason or God needed another hockey player in heaven. No matter how incapacitated I was, I would have taken them out. Instead, without words and without busy activity, they simply created an atmosphere of space and grace to allow me to know that I wasn't alone. What if we did that on a more communal, societal level? There's a northern village in Australia, an Aboriginal community that has one of the most beautiful communal rituals for this transition that I've ever seen. The night after the death of a child, everyone in the community will alter something in the external world. They'll topple pottery or leave a door ajar. They'll rearrange the furniture outside their homes. So when those grieving parents are ready to enter the world, they see the evidence of an external environment that's been altered. They know they're not alone. This community in the most beautiful, loving, generous way has said, our world is upside down as well. We can't imagine a world without the physical presence of your child. Imagine if they have the courage 
to enter that family's pain, the power in the ways they'll be able to participate is that family finds ways to turn their world back on kilter. So how do we come together to not only experience the sorrow of loss, but to invite in the joy of what could be? About a year after Ben's death, Steve was convinced that we should and could have another child. And I was convinced that he had lost his mind. Given our age, that would only be possible through adoption or surrogacy. And I wasn't sure how he was coping. Nothing could replace Ben. But then on another ordinary afternoon, I was driving Hannah Rose to piano practice, and she suddenly burst forth with an idea she had obviously been thinking about for a long time. She said, Mom, don't you think we could have another child? We just still have so much love to give. And she was right. We did. And I began to realize that we didn't have to resolve sorrow to enter into joy. And once I came around, I was all in. Several months later, we were awaiting the arrival of Zachary James. We had carefully chosen his name weeks before his expected delivery through a gestational surrogate. One night, we decided to go celebrate with Hannah Rose at a dinner theater. We were in that space where Ben's presence was always there, but we could also fully engage in what was coming next. During the intermission of this dinner theater, a waiter came by to clear the table, and he was holding a serving tray that had a piece of masking tape on it and in a black Sharpie marker the name Ben. Hannah Rose looked at me and her eyes twinkled and she looked at the waiter and said, oh, my brother's name is Ben. And without missing a beat, the waiter said, oh, I'm not Ben, I'm Zach. I'm just carrying Ben's tray. What a moment of wonder and serendipity. We don't know how our legacies are going to be carried on if it's going to be a huge memorial and a mausoleum, or if it's just simply a piece of masking tape that gives a family hope and wonder. We now tell that story to five-year-old Zach and his little sister, Meg. And it is a joy that we have created an after that both honors the reality of Ben and delights in the unique presence of these two children. We are able to create that kind of after because we were met in community and love and support by others. The world has experienced tremendous loss. So many of those structures of support and community and physical contact have collapsed. But what can we do? Friends can just sit with each other and share stories of heartache and loss without comparing or entering the pain Olympics, competing over whose loss is worse. Marriages can lean into the intimacy that's created when you accept both the sorrow and joy that inevitably happens over a lifetime together. We need leaders who will cultivate environments that embrace the full human experience, even in our work lives. We need leaders who show up not as heroes, but as human, understanding that the future is uncertain, but we need each other to navigate that together. And finally, we can all acknowledge that, yes, suffering is inevitable. We will experience heartache at some point in our life. But there is such tremendous comfort and healing and even growth when we're willing to witness and listen to each other's stories. Thank you for listening to mine.